And then the second turning point was I had, um, so I do finance for a living. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of like a spreadsheet nerd. So I had, I had looked at my net worth. I knew it was very, very negative. Um, however, what I hadn't done was I actually calculated the annual interest I was paying, which was about $16,000 a year. Um, and that to me was my wake up call. I, I realized I would never retire early, which was always one of my goals. Um, I realized I would never get wealthy if, uh, if I was paying this $16,000 every year. Um, and at the time, that was almost a third of my take home pay. Uh, so I realized, you know, a dollar of every three dollars of my paycheck was going to interest. And obviously that was not going to help me become wealthy. Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, the show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Mooners Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 367. This is the podcast where everyday millionaires spill the beans on their stacks of green. We're your hosts, Jason Stacy, ready to bring you the unscripted tales of wealth, warts and all, because who needs a script when you're rolling in dough? Join us as we dive into the net worths and asset allocations of regular folks turned financial titans. It's like cribs, but with fewer gold-plated toilets and more practical advice. We promise the only rare edits are to be kid-friendly, so you won't hear any naughty language, just lots of cha-ching and maybe a sprinkle of do-re-mi. So buckle up, tighten those purse strings, and get ready to laugh and learn with Millionaires Unveiled. To begin this week, we had a listener question from Jordan. He says, what are millionaires saving in real dollars compared to what they were saving before they loosened up, and how much has their net worth grown since then? Jordan, appreciate the question. We will definitely uh, start asking that in our rapid fire questions when we do some more interviews. Uh, to give a quick an- quick answer on this, I feel like we haven't had that many that I would say have quote unquote loosened up yet. I feel like a lot of them still continue to plug away. Once a saver, always a saver. Once an investor, always an investor type of mentality. And so it is it is something that I've 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 tried to focus on a little bit more and trying to get some of those you know, baby boomer age, retiree age people on the show where we can try to dive into this topic a little bit more because I do think it is generally difficult for people to make that switch from saving and investing to spending down their portfolio. That said, I have seen some on the show. I don't have any specific guests in mind, but I have seen some that have noted that they have started either spending more not necessarily maybe investing less, but they're investing less as a percentage of their income or a percentage of their net worth that they used to. And all of them, I think, would say that their net worth has substantially grown uh, during that process and during that time. Yeah, I think that tracks though, because as you've saved and invested more, you have more with compound interest, uh, you know, helping grow that that net worth. We also had a couple questions um, and responses. Uh, to previous episodes about the 4% rule. Yeah, which really kind of goes hand in hand about this question about kind of loosening up, so to speak. And so the the 4% rule, which has probably been in financial circles for quite a while, but it actually originated a very long time ago, uh, three decades back in 1994. Uh, it was a it was a paper published by William Bengen, or Bengen I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce, pronounce his name. And Basically, what it what it said is, you know, hey, let's track in history of all these different time periods and what was the rate that people could essentially begin to withdraw from their portfolio and still have plenty over, you know, a track, I think a 30 year, 40 year, 50 year time period, and then some 20 years and 10 year periods in the market and how many portfolios and different kinds of portfolio construction would still have money left in it, basically. And basically, it was settled on 4% to start. That doesn't mean 4% every year. It means 4% to start. So if you had a million-dollar portfolio, your first year of retirement, you could effectively spend $40,000. And then year two or year three or four or whatever, you'd have to continually adjust for inflation. And so at year two, let's just say 2% inflation, then it would go up to, you know, call it $40,800. If it went down, then we'd go down by $800, $39,200. So that was the premise of what the 4% rule was when it was first published. 
And at, at this point, I think it is a highly debated topic because we've seen inflation go through the roof at different points. We've seen the market return, uh, outsized returns in, in different time periods. And I looked this up actually, it's pretty crazy about only 60% of financial advisors that were polled part of this poll uh, really take to or adhere to the 4% rule in this day and age. So it has somewhat declined. I think it was much more widely accepted in previous years and still a lot of people hold to it and, and, and believe that it can be a pr- predictor of what you are able to withdraw uh, in retirement. But the debate and probably that other 40%, uh, you know, brings in some of these other ex- external factors, call it inflation that we've never seen before, call it spending, uh, you know, all these different things that maybe weren't as prevalent in the time periods of the 40s and the 60s and the 80s that basically this paper was written on that were happening. So that said, it's been brought up on our show multiple times. Some people uh, believe that it still is, uh, you know, kind of a gold standard and there's plenty of people that uh, do not. And it's a hotly debated topic. And, you know, personally, I don't really have a side on it, honestly. I think it, it is kind of a uh, an interesting thing to think about, but I don't know that I would build my portfolio around 4%. When I get to retirement, maybe I withdraw 4%. Maybe I don't. I don't know. It's not something that uh, I essentially have been trying to build my portfolio to get to a point to that 4% because I just feel like, you know, what I'm in my mid 30s, it's 30 years away potentially from what quote unquote retirement age may be or when I think I may start working, stop working in 20 years, 25 years, who knows? But it's a, it's a long way out there to try to project what I might be spending at that point because it really comes down to, to what you're spending. So appreciate all those that have written in on it and those that have commented on it. And uh, we'll continue to uh, pay attention to it for the years to come and see, see if it holds or see if it changes or maybe goes down 3.5% or maybe goes up to 4.5%. Who knows? So today our guest is Corey. She's got a net worth of $1.3 million. She works in finance. Uh, She overcame some significant debt from some school loans and some others uh, to basically have about a million and a half dollar turnaround. So it's going to be a great episode with her. Can't wait. And let's get right into it with Corey. Welcome to the Millionaires and Build podcast. In this show, we have Corey. Corey, you want to just give us about your background and what you're up to now? Yeah. So my name is Corey Arnold. I I became a millionaire uh, two years ago. Um, So pretty exciting. The the exciting part is because I had a ton of debt. So I had $260,000 worth of debt about 12 years ago, 140,000 was student loans, and then 22,000 was credit cards. Um, So, you know, I had a big turnaround. And I think a lot of people say like a millionaire these days, and especially in your 40s, isn't that big of an achievement. Um, But because I was such a financial mess in my late 20s and early 30s, um, for me, it's, it's a pretty big achievement. Awesome. And we're going to get into all the details here about paying off all that debt. But before we do, what's your net worth today? Yeah, so it's just over 1.3. Um, and it's broken down. I have about 750 in my 401k. And then I have about 500,000 in real estate, um, 50,000 in a discount brokerage account, and then about 10,000 in uh, just a cash checking account. Awesome. And is all the money that's in essentially retirement accounts, brokerage, is that in index funds, bonds, mutual funds? What's the breakup there? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so I am a big fan of index funds. Um, so my retirement is 100% index funds. And then more recently, the discount brokerage. Um, I've been trying different strategies with it. But recently, I've, I've gone for um, like dividend growth stocks as well as uh, using some covered call options with them. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that strategy in the future. Um, but it's only, I've only tried it for about two months. So, so far, so good. Awesome. And do you plan to, to deviate from that asset allocation at all? That's a good question. Um, so I'm hoping I, I still work a nine to five. Um, I, I work in finance and I'm hoping that I can, uh, retire in, in five years or less. Once I can do that, then I think the allocation will be different. So, uh, real estate right now, I actually have two non-producing, two non-income producing, um, real estate properties. Uh, one is just my primary residence and then one is 
um, the vacation home, uh, which is kind of funny because I know a lot of your listeners, they, um, you know, they have real estate, they're real estate investors. I'm kind of the opposite. I have made some of the money in real estate, but I will probably um, push more toward the uh, that discount brokerage. That's my real goal to pump that up a little bit. Do you plan on selling either of those pieces of real estate as you look towards retirement? No, that's a good question. I do not actually. So the cool thing about my job is I am 100% remote. Um, so I do spend uh, summers north and uh, winters down south. <laughs> so that part is good. And I don't really want to change that, you know, that pattern. Snowbird and early. I love it. <laughs> How long ago did you start doing that? Um, it was funny. It actually kind of happened by accident. Uh, so in 2020, right at the height of COVID, like when everyone was very scared, February 2020, um, we decided to buy a property in Myrtle Beach, actually. And um, it was funny because, uh, you know, everyone's scared. So you get a really good deal on the property. And then so we got a good deal. And then um the problem was that we actually bought it to rent. And then uh, and then what happened was that summer, no one wanted to go on vacation anywhere. Everyone was still pretty scared. Uh, so we didn't get many tenants. And the ones we did get were not great tenants. Um, so that has been my experience with renting. And I know that's not your typical, um, your typical interviewee. But um, so that was 2020. Then in 21, it appreciated dramatically. And we had kind of had it with renters. So then um, in 21, actually literally like a year later, we decided to buy another property. Um, and that, that that property actually appreciated like 60000 uh, just in the year. And then um, we bought the second property with the plan that uh, we weren't going to rent it out. We actually bought it in an HOA that doesn't allow short-term rentals. Interesting. Is there any plan to, to migrate south completely? I know that's common for people that, that live in the north, or do you think you'll snowbird forever? I'll probably snowbird forever. I uh, I have a lot of family up north, um, so I probably, I kind of like the, um, the freedom of being able to move around. I mean, to be honest, like, um, picking my current job, you know, at a certain salary versus taking a job where I would have to be physically somewhere, um, for more money, I would probably pick my current job, uh, just because of that, that freedom. I don't really have to be in one place at one time. I do travel for work every once in a while, but, um, for the most part, like being, I mean, it's not that I really work less hours. I feel like I'm, you know, working plenty of hours, but, um, just having that freedom to kind of go where you want, when you want is, is very nice. How long ago did you start having that kind of freedom with, with your job? Yeah, the interesting thing is, I mean, a lot of people think that COVID started that. But actually, in 2014, uh, my company was purchased by another per, uh, company. And then in 2018, they decided to shut my company, like my site down. It's a global company. Um, so they shut it down. They did let go of quite a bit of people, but they decided to keep me <laughs> for some reason. And uh, I did not. I did not take the relocation package. So I stayed where I was. And again, I thought I was, I thought they were going to let me go um, because I told them no and they decided to keep me. So since 2018, I've actually been working remotely. Wow. What a journey. Is that something that I, I guess, you know, you say you wouldn't take a job for more money, but can you put a dollar value on that freedom at all? I mean, is it double what you would make now, retire a couple years earlier, or is it just like not even a question for you at this point? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, actually. Um, you know, for the right, there are a couple of jobs out there that I would probably take um, making the same money that I'm making today. But um, no, I mean, d double, that's <laughs> that's a pretty good increase. Um, yeah, I mean, probably if they paid me 50 percent more or 100 percent, then yeah, I would probably I would probably stay stay put somewhere. Awesome. So. Let's rewind here a little bit. Let's go back to to this pile of debt. When did it peak and how old were you when it peaked? Yeah, so I got my MBA. Um, and I graduated with that around age 30. And then at 31, that was kind of the peak. Um, I had two turning points where I, I finally realized that I was just overspending. Um, the first was... I actually watched a Susie Orman special on TV where she had um, she brought this overspender, like a natural spender, to the stage where this woman she couldn't figure out like how how to stop spending, and um, she brought out a rack of this woman's clothes and then a pile of cash worth uh, sixty five hundred dollars, and the clothes were supposedly worth sixty five hundred dollars, and um, 
she asked the woman like a very simple question, would you rather have the cash or the clothes? And it's it's such a simple question, but to see it tangibly and realize that, man, I was just wasting all this money on stuff that I didn't need. Um, that was really a turning point for me. And it kind of shifted my mindset on, um, you know, what I actually wanted to prioritize in life, what my values were. And then the second turning point was I had, um, so I do finance for a living. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of like a spreadsheet nerd. So I had, I had looked at my net worth. I knew it was very, very negative. Um, however, what I hadn't done was I actually calculated the annual interest I was paying, which was about $16,000 a year. Um, and that to me was my wake up call. I, I realized I would never retire early, which was always one of my goals. Um, I realized I would never get wealthy if, uh, if I was paying this $16,000 every year. Um, and at the time, that was almost a third of my take home pay. Uh, so I realized, you know, a dollar of every three dollars of my paycheck was going to interest. And obviously, that was not going to help me become wealthy. This debt that you had, was it primarily consumer debt or otherwise? Yeah, so 140,000 was student loans and then 22,000 was credit cards. Um the funny part of this is 98,000 was real estate and that was actually on two different properties, <laughs> uh, which sounds kind of crazy given today's prices. Um but this was in a very rural, like both properties were in a very rural area. I had bought the duplex um, for 68000 I ended up selling it for sixty because it was just a hassle. And again, I've never, it's funny, I've never had luck with tenants. I, um, you know, I do really well in other <laughs> other ventures, like flipping property, for example. Um, but for some reason with tenants, I, I'm just not great with picking the people. I'm not picking, you know, I don't pick the right properties. Um, so yeah, so the, the, Half of that debt, you know, half of the ninety-eight thousand was on a duplex, which I sold for a loss. Um, but at the same time, it did actually help me bring down the debt, which was good. And then the other half was on a primary residence, which was a a fixer upper again in a very rural area. Stace, name some business partners that have really got it done. Procter and Gamble. Ben and Jerry. Supply and demand. Salt and pepper. Peanut butter and jelly. What about the perfect partners when it comes to growing your business? That's Shopify. That's right. That's you and Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to did we just hit a million order stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling shipping supplies or promoting productivity programs, Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system wherever and whatever you're selling. Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout up to 36% better compared to the leading commerce platforms and sell more with less thanks to Shopify Magic your AI-powered all-star. What I love about Shopify is no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklyn, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash unveiled all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash unveiled now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash unveiled. And thanks again to Shopify for supporting today's episode. So when you decided to make this change, how did you go about paying it all down? Yeah, that's a good question. So at the time I had, um, I knew my lender, which worked out very well. So she had, for this fixer upper, she had given me a a regular mortgage plus a little extra to do some work on the house. Um, But the problem with that was my rate was a bit higher. So it was like 5% at the time, which rates were a lot lower than. Um, So what I did, I I did some things that most financial experts would tell you not to do. Um, I had a credit card that was like 15% and I it's you know unsecured debt. I consolidated it with my mortgage. I refinanced the mortgage and got that rate down to like three point two five. Um, I also I did that with another credit card. I had a car like a car which was worth I don't know maybe twelve twelve thousand dollars, and I um, I didn't have a loan on it, so I put the credit card balance on the car, and again I saved some money on the interest. Um, so I did little things like that, um, and and the thing is like I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to a lot of people. But if you are fully, fully committed, because obviously I was taking on more risk. If I didn't make those payments, I, um, 
you know, I, they could take my house obviously, or they could take my car. Uh, so I, I did some things like that. I also just got really lean. Um, so I really, like I stopped, (laughs) I have a, an example where I had a friend give me a Keurig machine and she, um, or I realized that I was spending like 10 to $12 a week, which sounds like nothing, you know, it's like 500 bucks a year. Um, but I didn't really need that, that coffee. So I donated the Keurig machine. Um, so it's little things like that. Like I got pretty lean, like one summer I didn't use any air conditioning, which I, I lived north more north so i could i could live with that um but they're just little things like you know 10 of those things that's five grand a year that you could save uh the other thing i did was again i'm you know i i like numbers i like spreadsheets so i actually use zero percent credit uh credit cards and my student loans at the time were like between 6.8 and 8.5 percent um which sounds crazy today but um i took those i had four different credit cards and i kind of would rotate the 0% deals um and the cool thing is i like over the fi- it took me 5 years to pay off that debt over that time um i saved about $10,000 in interest so so i just did little like hacks like that and i was very very committed um it it worked out it's it did take 5 long years <laughs> to do that though was the goal to pay off the debt or was the goal then I want to become a millionaire or, you know, how did you bridge that gap? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, at first it was just get out of debt because I like, again, I could not see myself ever becoming wealthy if I just like let it sit and linger. Um, so that was the first goal. But at the same time that I did that, I had started for this new company in 2011. Um, and I had started contributing like 10% to my retirement account. So I did that again for that almost six years until I paid off the the debt. And by the time I did that, I had um, about a little over a hundred thousand in my retirement account. So that was very exciting to me. And then once I saw that, you know, I, so I paid off the debt. I wasn't starting from zero. I actually had like a six figure net worth, which was definitely a first for me. And um, so that was exciting. And then I realized, you know, wow, I'm a 10th of the way there. I can probably figure this out. Um, so I, I'm a little impatient, but, you know, slowly over time, I, I started to to build that up. Right. How long did it take you from the time that you uh, started in debt to becoming a millionaire? Yeah, it was 10 years. So it was five years on the paying off debt. And then at the same time, you know, I had about 100K in the retirement. So from that point was another five years. Um, and to do that, like I flipped three properties and I, um, I also, you know, continued to invest in index funds as well as some single stocks in 2020 when it was very, the stock market was very volatile. Did you start increasing your standard of living after you paid off the debt or has that ever not kind of happened since you've paid off the debt? Yeah, I, okay. So I, um, I became very frugal (laughs) for definitely those five years. Um, and then uh, the good thing is I actually stayed pretty frugal. I did buy a new truck. Um, so that was a pretty big expense for me a few, like uh, four years ago. And then I, I lived in a pretty old house for a long time, but then in 2021, that, that place at the beach, that was a, uh, that was probably a lifestyle increase. Um, that was really nice as well as I literally just bought a new house, um, this past summer. So I I've been here for, I don't know, six months. Um, so yeah, so my standard of living has, has increased slowly, but it, it's been intentional and it hasn't been fast. Like that is one thing I've learned through this whole journey is slow and steady actually does work. Um, patience actually works. Um, so I, I do try to make more intentional choices these days, uh, than I used to talk us through a little bit, the, the mindset of going in paying off all this debt, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're getting so frugal but you're still putting money away and in investments, you know, kind of walk us through the psychology of, I mean, I'm guessing at the end of every month, you're basically at zero because everything's going out to these different directions. And then yeah. you know, you're really not building up a lot of savings. You're building up your investments, but yeah. you don't have a lot of cash in the bank. Is that is that directionally accurate of kind of how this process was w- working for you? Yeah, that's very true. So I had a nice, healthy uh, discount brokerage account <laughs> about uh, about a year ago, actually. And um, I had to make the choice on this new house, whether to um, take a loan out on it or to just, you know, basically empty my brokerage account. So I decided to actually empty the brokerage account. I don't know if that was the best choice or not, but that's what I did because I getting out of debt was so hard for me. And I really it, like it actually like 
hurt. <laughs> you know, it, it felt like it was going to hurt to go into more debt. Um, it just felt stressful. So, um, so yeah, you're right. Like 80, 80 to 85% of my money is going to the discount brokerage now to rebuild that account. Um, and it's funny. Um, it is a mindset shift. I used to love spending money and, you know, getting stuff. And now I realize like stuff doesn't really make you happy. Um, you know, going shopping for like new clothes. That's just, it's, it's interesting how priorities shift. And for me, that's been a big game changer. Um, so I love to invest. Like I, I like to see how my investments are growing. I like to see the dividends. I like to see the cover call premiums. Um, it, it's interesting. You're right. Like the mindset shift is very, very different. Um, I get joy out of different things now. So, you know, I like experiences more than against stuff like, um, going shopping to me just doesn't sound that fun anymore. Um, you know, I might go maybe twice a year to buy new clothes and, uh, shoes, but, but really it's, it is, it's a mindset shift and it's enjoying the investing versus like thinking that I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sacrificing or anything like that. I would love to know what kind of role has your spouse played in this journey? Yeah. So my, um, yep. I have a partner and, um, she was actually my like money mentor. So she's a little bit older than me and she, uh, she is, is pretty wealthy herself. We actually don't, we don't mix our money. So all those numbers I gave you are just mine. Um, we kind of keep separate accounts. It, it just works for us. Um, and we, we do things together like those flip properties we did together. Um, it's fun. So all the real estate that we have, we're 50, 50 in it. Um, but, but it's good. And I, I learned a lot from her. She really is more of a index fund investor. Um, I am the the riskier one financially. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's been very good for me because I kind of see her mind, mindset and I see, um, you know, how, how it's fared for her, which is, which is good. Did she kind of help instigate the shift from, uh, spending money to saving money and building wealth? You know, that's funny. So I actually met her um, after, after I kind of made this decision, but it's funny. It wasn't that much after, like, uh, so it might've been, I don't know, 11 years ago. And um, I started this journey about 12 and a half years ago. So I was kind of already mentally like committed to getting out of the debt. Um, But I think just yeah, talking through things with her, I think it definitely helped. Um, It definitely helped make me stronger. And also again, like, really solidify my priorities and, um, and see that, you know, again, I was just wasting a lot of money on, on stuff that didn't matter. Well, good. Then she caught you at a good time, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Very, very much. So I wonder actually sometimes like why she even stuck her out at the beginning. Cause I was so in the red, you know, but I guess she saw something. <laughs> I'm curious as well. You've been in the finance industry and you were in this debt. Did that weigh heavily on you, given your career? Uh, yeah, that's actually funny you say that. So in high school, um, I had a group of friends, and I was always the one like I liked the numbers, I liked the the money, and I was supposed to be and and I was in accounting and finance, and uh, I was supposed to be the one that was good with my money of all my friends, and uh, you know they're nurses and they're. Um, they do all sorts of other things, but none of them are finance. And I and yeah, I did. I actually felt a little guilt about that because I was. I always thought like I'm supposed to be the one that's good with my money, but I'm you know I'm spending it on all kinds of stuff, and and I'm probably the one in biggest debt. You know, I don't know if they were actually in more debt than me. Probably not, but uh, I was probably in the biggest hole. Well, hey, at least you went into it. Well, you had the abundance mentality because you were like, look, there's money everywhere. I just got to make some more of it. True. <laughs> exactly. I definitely think mindset is a big thing. And I, I think abundance and being optimistic and positive, um, you know, obviously we, we all have bad days, but really trying to see the bright side in everything and, and understanding that, you know, your energy actually plays, plays a big role in, in some of your results is, is important. How much did your income grow while you were paying off the debt? I've heard a lot of stories where people, you know, their income, it's funny how that when they focus on their debt or they focus on their, their money, um, good things happen. And that was exactly what happened to me. So not only from a salary standpoint, but, you know, I was focusing and all of a sudden, like I would get extra money, like I would get a bonus at work or I would get um, a tax return that I wasn't expecting. Um, so all those things kind of added up, which was ended up being very good for me. 
from the salary perspective, it also grew. So one of, my, you know, obviously we have two levers. We have our income and our expense. Um, when I started this journey, my take home was around 48, 50,000. And when I ended it, it's pretty, it was pretty healthy in the six figures. Um, so, you know, I understood like the more I contribute at work, the more value I provide at work, the more they're going to, um, reimburse me or pay me. Um, so, so I definitely understood that I started finding like, um, niches at work. So I, I found like certain spots where I could be an expert and then people really (laughs) needed me. So it worked out in my favor a lot, but yeah, the salary was a big part of it. it. It continued to grow as I got more serious about it. And I know you mentioned that the, the company had been bought out and whatnot, but all all things considered, have you been effectively with the same company since you got your MBA? Yeah, since 2011, I'm basically with the same company. A, a few carve outs, a few purchases, but same company. I am in a different role. So I, I joined a different team about a year and a half ago. And um, it's good. It's really good for me because prior to that, I was kind of in the same product line, the same team. Um, so, so it's definitely good to get out of your comfort zone and, you know, meet new people, even if it's with the same, the same big company. Do you think you'll finish there and retire from there as well? That is my plan. (laughs) I don't know if that will happen or not. Uh, but that is the plan. Uh, if I can, you know, stick with them for five to seven more years, I, I think, uh, that, that would be the current plan. So the five to seven more, let's talk about that for a second. Is, is that because you think you're going to have the number or is it more of the age or is it just a feel? Walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, I have a couple. So it's interesting. I have like one of them, I have a big, big goal that's way, way out there in the future. And um, I, I'm not really like it's, it's a dream or I'm not I don't have a plan to actually achieve it because it's very, very big. But um, in the near term, I, I currently have a side hustle. So I kind of have like a personal brand and I, you know, I, I make a little money there. So that's continues to grow every month. And then I also, um, like from a retirement standpoint, if I could hit the million dollars in my 401k, which I, I think I can easily hit probably in five years, as well as I would like to hit, um, I don't know, like 400k in my um, discount brokerage would be great. If, if I calculate that out, I can make a pretty decent um, dividend and cover call income each year. Um, so those are kind of the numbers I'm playing with. Nothing's really, it's funny. I did this in 2020. I kind of wrote out my goals for retirement, like my numbers. Um, and it's really funny how they've changed. <laughs> uh, you kind of, I kind of had a, a plan for every year. So like, you know, we're in 24, um, where I was, and it's kind of funny to see the different like asset allocation. So I didn't plan on having as much value in real estate that I do today. Uh, but I, and I had planned on having a much bigger discount per uh, balance, but you know, things happen, life happens and, and your priorities change. So I'm still within the goal. It's just, um, how I get there might be a little different. So you've got this big goal. Do you have to wait till retirement to do it? No. And I may not even ever do it. Like I need a lot of money. I want to buy a certain company. And um, I need like millions and millions of dollars to do that. So I don't really like reality from a, it's, it's hard for me to really, I try to visualize it, but it's hard for me to realistically visualize it um, because I'm not even close. Um, and I am working towards it today, but you know, if it happens, it happens. I'd be great. If it doesn't, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. It's, it's a hard one because like part of me thinks it would be um, really cool to acquire this company. Uh, but at the same time, I, I've wanted this goal since like 2020 and, uh, you know, inflation has happened. So like the price of it keeps increasing. Um, so, you know, if it doesn't happen, I, it's not going to kill me <laughs> anyway. What do you think that number is that you need to live on in retirement? And how do you think about, I mean, just walk us through being so young in your forties, you know, how do you think about transitioning to that point in your life <laughs> and, you know, health insurance and all the things that come with that emotionally and some of the financial aspects. But I know there's a lot of people that we bring on and that I talk to that the, this emotional transition is really one of the hardest outside of just the, the couple financial things along with, you know, the health insurance. But talk us through that because clearly you've been thinking about it and, and have got this plan in place. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. So when I started like seriously considering or thinking about it in 2020, I actually, that was my first thought, like, what am I going to do all day? How am I going to spend my time? Um, and then I, and then I looked at some of my numbers and I'm like, wow, like, I don't want to be limited. Like, you know, I don't want to be tight the rest of my life. Um, that's not why I work this hard. Um, so that's when I had to extend my retirement goal a bit. 
uh, to figure out, you know, what, what numbers really make me comfortable. And, um, not that I need to like, you know, spend lavishly for retirement. I'm not planning to do that, but I also don't want to be limited. Um, and like you said, there's, there's other things to consider, like how you will spend your time. Will you spend more money if you're traveling more, for example, um, there's health insurance. So we have done a budget, um, and we've done a comfortable budget. So, and this is going to sound like a high number, I think, but between the two of us in the two houses, I, we would be comfortable on like a hundred thousand a year, which I, it's kind of crazy, but that would like, that would cover like, I think, 30,000 of that is insurance. Um, so there's some big numbers there. There's some property tax in there that's pretty expensive, but um, that would be very, very comfortable. And I, I think we can probably hit it again, like in the five to seven years. But um, but that was kind of the, I got depressed, <laughs> not really depressed, but I got kind of sad like four years ago when I looked at it and I was thinking like I could live on 40,000 a year. But then I started like looking at the numbers and um and now with inflation, like they would probably even be worse. But, uh, you know, again, like I don't want to I want to figure out how I can spend my time and um, enjoy it and not feel like I'm worried about uh, my finances all the time. So there, it's a weird balance. So I think it's somewhere between 40 and 100. Let's call it that. Um, it's hard to really know what that that number is. You know how much you spend now? Yeah, we're at about um, maybe 60, 60 a year without. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We'll just have insurance though. You know, that's that's a big one for a while. Yep. Okay, so you're like already in or you're already in that range as it is. Yeah. Yeah, understandable. Well, cool. Let's uh let's wrap up with some rapid fire questions. What's the uh most expensive pair of shoes that you've ever purchased? Yeah, so I actually I'm pretty lean except especially on clothes except for uh running shoes and I I get a new pair of shoes about every 6 months um so about 180 bucks on like A6 running shoes. Okay. Uh what about the uh, most expensive car? Probably that truck you just bought a few years ago, yeah. That is it. Yeah, and I paid um this is going to sound like nothing given today's prices, but in 2016 I bought it for like um uh 37 I think was the price. Pay cash? Yeah. Nice. Awesome. And you're still driving it today, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. It's almost at a hundred thousand miles, <laughs> and I'm not planning to uh, to buy a new one anytime soon. Nice. Uh, what's the most expensive meal out that you pay for? Yeah, on vacation with my family. Like this is a few people um, in my immediate family, so it it was about four hundred bucks. Okay. What about the uh, most expensive experience or or trip? Yeah, um, actually, yeah, my most expensive and my most fun, uh, we went to St. John Virgin Islands back in 2016, actually kind of to celebrate my uh, my debt free freedom. Um, and it, it was a lot of fun. We like we did not do the typical tourist thing uh, where they all like rent a vehicle. We just hiked the entire um, island. It's I think it's like six to 10 miles wide. So it's not really too big. Um, we just hiked all week, which was great. What do you still have on the bucket list other than buying this multi-million dollar company? You know, um, so I'm a really competitive person. And a few years ago, I went to the Grand Canyon and I hiked it. So I went to the bottom and back up and it took us 11 hours. And I like the thing I need to do is go back there and see if I can do it a lot faster <laughs> um, because I, uh, it's funny how some things like bother you. And that's one thing that I want to do hopefully in the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, what's a key lesson you learned from childhood? I did not uh, grow up with too many resources. Um, we were pretty, They, my parents, they had lots and lots of love. So they gave me lots of values, but they really were never like career focused. They they weren't real ambitious that way. Um, so hard work was really pushed into me and uh, and it, it was good for me. I'm happy. I'm happy I learned that. Okay. What was your first job? <laughs> Um, so again, I, I came from a very rural area. So I was actually a strawberry picker at a strawberry farm. <laughs> and I made a quarter per, per, per quart of strawberries. <laughs> so I wasn't making much money. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And how old were you when you did that? Uh, I think I started like sixth or seventh grade. And I would pick as many as I could. So I would try to get like, I don't know, 80 quarts a day, which I don't know what that equates to in dollars. But I know that my cousin also worked there. And she would spend the whole day and pick like eight quarts. And that would be like $2 <laughs> for the whole day of work. Um, so I just always thought that was funny that she would do that. But You were hustling. You made like 20. She made two. I like it. <laughs> Got to get something out of your time, right? Uh, what's the dumbest thing that you've ever wasted money on? 
Uh, that's a good one. Um, there, I've I've wasted a lot of money in my days. Um, you know, I bought this when I was 28. I was living. I actually moved to Los Angeles, and I um, I had no money. I maxed out my credit cards, um, and I decided that I really wanted this bookcase, and I didn't have the money. So I actually borrowed the money from like my 25 year old sister. Um, and I look back on that. I mean, I did pay her back, but I look back on that, and I'm like, why couldn't I have just waited, you know, to get that stupid bookcase? Awesome. Well, what is something that you've spent way too much money on, but you don't regret it? Mm-hmm. Interesting. I mean, probably this house that I'm in <laughs> right now. Um, so we bought it kind of at the at the higher end of the market, um, but I, I actually really love it. But you paid cash too, right? So it feels a little different. I did. Yeah. 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 It yeah. Still, still, <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> hurts a little bit. Do you regret that? Do you wish you had a mortgage on it? No, no. No, I I don't actually. Okay. Uh, what's what financial habit has changed the most since you became a millionaire? I think tracking my money. Um, I mean, it sounds. Uh, I talk about this all the time on some of my online accounts, but um, like tracking, it's it's so easy, and if you don't track, you don't actually know what you're spending every month. Um, so that is one thing that I I do pretty consistently, um, at least once a month. Um, I kind of just update my net worth, um, look at my spending. I don't, it's funny. I, I used to be really strict with a budget. Um, I'm not so strict anymore because I kind of have an idea, uh, what's going in and out, but there's, it's just so interesting to me how our brains work and, um, how, when you don't track and you're not thinking about it, um, how much you can spend and not even realize it. Yeah, for sure. What's the craziest thing that you've ever done to earn money? I, um, this one's kind of funny. So when, I think when I was 22, my best friend and I at the time, we decided to buy these four wheelers, um, or ATVs. And we, um, so we rode them like every weekend and then I'm not sure what happened if she moved away or something, but we kind of stopped using them. So I decided to sell it on eBay one year to get some extra money because I had a little loan on it. So my brother and sister and I, we actually drove up about five hours away to another city uh, and on Christmas Eve. And we I've heard so many like horror stories about people <laughs> selling stuff online and then they get to the person and like the people like rip them off or steal it. But we actually we had no bad luck. Uh, the guy gave me a personal check, which I was a little nervous about. But I, I also didn't have the title because I had a loan on it. Um, so we had to trust each other and it, it all worked out good. And uh, we made it back in time for Christmas Eve. What's a closely held belief that you once had that you recently changed your mind on? When I this isn't so recent, but when I was in high school, I thought my parents were so weird because they didn't have debt. Um, but at the same time, they weren't making a lot of money. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of new stuff, right? I barely ever got new clothes. I, you know, we had what we needed. We had food, of course. But um, for as a teenager, like, you know, that sucks. And, and um, I just thought my parents were so weird. Like, why wouldn't they want to get some debt and like give us more stuff or, you know, but uh, anyway, I obviously now I know they were right. You know, they did the right thing. So they're, they're much better off financially than if they had listened to me as a, as a high schooler. Any last words of advice for somebody who's just starting out on their journey? Yeah, I think the best thing, um, I am not naturally a patient person. Um, so for example, I, um, a few years ago, actually like a while ago, I ended up with like six eating tickets in, in my state. And they, they sent me a letter saying that they were going to suspend my license if I got one more speeding ticket. So I, you know, I don't like to like slow down. I don't, you know, I'm always doing something I'm always getting into something. Um, but I have learned, through my life that patience and like slow and steady actually works. Um, it's, it's really easy to get in a rush and to like, you know, want to earn a hundred thousand dollars or, or become a millionaire overnight, but that's just not how it works generally. Um, so slow and steady really, really works. That that's what I would tell anyone who's starting out. Um, and that's the advice I really needed, but, and I'm, I'm sure people told me that and I just didn't listen, but that's what I would tell, tell someone. Awesome. That's Corey with a net worth of one plus or one point two million dollars. Thanks for coming to the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.